Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 through 9, as it is custom for this house. Please stand with me if you're able to. We have two scriptures today, Jeremiah 20, verses 7 through 9, and then Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Now begin reading with the prophet Jeremiah. He says, you deceived me, Lord. You deceived me, Lord. You tricked me, Lord. You persuaded me, Lord. And I was indeed persuaded. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed, made fun of, laughed, mocked all day long. Everybody mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me nothing but insult and reproach all day long. But if I say, if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is still in my heart like a fire, a fire that is shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in tired of keeping it to myself. Indeed, I can no longer. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. I thank my God every time I remember y'all at Antioch. In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in this ministry, your partnership in the message, your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. If you would allow, I'd like to discuss the topic, the anatomy of an anniversary. Please take your seats. The anatomy of an anniversary. What is an anniversary? It is an annual recurrence of a date marking a notable event. Every year on the same date, we celebrate some type of special achievement or event. A few things that we often celebrate each year are birthdays, wedding anniversaries, National holidays, memorial services. Some people celebrate sobriety or other personal achievements. Every year, we acknowledge some type of milestone event that is worthy of celebration. And as special as your birthday is, as beautiful as your marriage is, as, as awesome as your personal achievements are, those things pale in comparison to the miraculous, powerful, awe-inspiring, sustaining of Antioch Christian Fellowship for 21 whole years. If anything is worth celebrating, we should celebrate that Antioch's 21st anniversary is merely the continuing fulfillment of God's 2,000-year-old promise to the Apostle Peter that Jesus would build his church and the powers of hell, the tricks of Satan, the attacks of the enemy would never prevail against it. But, but to truly, to truly appreciate the significance of this 21st year celebration, we need to examine the anatomy of, of an anniversary. Every anniversary consists of three main components, a starting point, a middle process, and an expected end. A starting point, a middle process, and and expected in anything with an anniversary had a starting point. We can't celebrate 21 years without celebrating day number one of year number one. And in order to have an anniversary, you must, you must endure the, the middle process of hardships, the, the facing of opposition, the overcoming of obstacles, surviving enemy attacks, ignoring the doubters, naysayers, and even ignoring yourself when you doubt your ability to persevere through everything that comes your way. And, and the motivation that you develop to keep going, the fortitude, 
for not giving up on the thing that you started is this expected end that you imagine before you initially got started. Sometime to see a thing through, you got to constantly reflect on the promise in your mind. Every anniversary consists of a starting point, a middle process, and an expected end. You think about birthdays. You start as an embryo. You grow in your mother's womb. You're born and endure the arduous middle process of adulthood, and you hope to reach an expected end of good health, retirement, and long life with family. Think about marriages. Marriages, you start out as single you get married, and boy, do you enjoy the honeymoon vacation. Then, then you start to endure the arduous middle process of learning to become one. Navigate the daily life challenges together with the person you pledge your life to, and you hope to reach an expected end of growing old together, honoring your marriage covenant in the sight of God and inspiring one another to faithfully honor and glorify God until death do you both part. Yeah, but Christianity, Christianity, the same applies. You start out as a buck heathen, neck deep in sin, or maybe that was just me. God woos you. He compels you to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, and you become a member of Antioch. But, but then you begin to endure the arduous middle process of faithfully attending Sunday worship, faithfully attending midweek Bible study, tithing, we're still working on that, Vol volunteering in various ministries, and, and then learning to forsake your own desires in exchange for obedience to Christ and his moral standards. And, and you remain committed, committed to this middle process because you hope that God will honor your sacrifice in the earth and let you dwell in heaven with him for the rest of eternity. Every anniversary consists of a starting point, a middle process, and an expected end. We, we can only celebrate 21 years because of how this whole thing started in the first place. It started with a call to preach God's word, a, a, a commitment to an arduous middle process, and a vision of an expected end. It, it has not only been modeled by Dr. Respice and Lady Charmaine for 20, 21 years, but it was first modeled by the prophet Jeremiah, and then again by Jesus Christ himself. With everything, with everything we have planned to commemorate today's anniversary achievement. Let us not celebrate year 21 and overlook what it was like for the individuals that started this whole thing in the first place. It all began with this call from God to preach the gospel. When God calls you to preach, teach, and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, he places something deep down on the inside of you that's almost unexplainable. And, and at times it seems downright irrational and foolish. The call of God, it compels you. It, it compels you to do things that seem a bit unwise and reckless. What would make your pastor walk away from a lucrative career in law to become a preacher of the gospel? I remember that. An occupation that many people run from all their lives. It's an occupation that typically doesn't pay much. An occupation that places financial stress upon families and households. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's an occupation that constantly holds you accountable to the highest moral standards in existence. And as soon as you fall, everybody in the church is going to let you know about it. It's an occupation that, that calls you to take on the problems of everybody else while ignoring your own problems in the process. A call to preach a message ordained by God to people who don't even want to hear the truth. To people who, who get offended when you call out sin. People who get angry when you command them to repent. People who get upset when you share the consequences of rebellion and you call them to repentance. To have them gossip about you behind your back. Have them betray you and attack you and stop supporting the church whenever they get upset or just outright leave and don't never come back just because they don't like what you said. And then they blame you for all of their church hurt. What would compel a man? To leave a well-paying job 
to consistently expose his heart to people he cares about. Only to be trampled on by people who prefer the false doctrines and false teachings of today's misguided church. To understand what seems to be a foolish rationale, we have to start with this word compel. Now this word compel is defined by the Oxford Dictionary. It means to force or apply pressure to someone, making them legally or morally bound to an action or course of action. It means it's an internal feeling that, that inspires you to do the right thing. But when we look at the Hebrew definition of compel, it means to speak, to declare, to proclaim, to command, or to counsel. This, this word, this Hebrew word, is an internal feeling that inspires you to verbally share a message from God for the benefit of others, even, even if it doesn't make any rational sense at all. And, and the longer you try to hold it in, the more restless you become. And, and it starts to feel like a constant fire burning down on the inside. But, but this fire, this fire, this compulsion to share God's message begins to cause an internal struggle. Once you realize that your message of morality just might end up getting you hurt. What would y'all do if you had valuable information that people needed to know? Would you share it knowing that they needed it? Or would you remain silent if you knew it would end with you being hurt? That's the tension, the tension of the text. All right, let's play, let's play a little game. Imagine with me for a few minutes. Imagine, and talk back to me if you can. Imagine that you have a best friend and y'all been best friends since kindergarten. Y'all are now all grown up and, and you both are married with children and y'all are tithing members of Antioch Christian Fellowship. You're out one day running errands, minding your own business, and you see your best friend's spouse somewhere he or she shouldn't be all hugged up with someone that ain't his or her spouse. I know it's getting juicy. You make eye contact with the cheating spouse, but he or she continues the hug fest like they don't even care that you saw him. Well. <laughs> <At first, laughs> tell the truth, shame the devil. <laughs> at first, at first you're confused. This can't be your best friend's spouse. I thought he or she was a Christian. I thought they were faithful. How could this be? Are my eyes deceiving me? Then, then you transition, you, you are heartbroken for your friend to know that he or she is clueless about this infidelity. Then, then you get, you get angry because you busted the cheater in the act, but then they acted like they don't even care that you saw him. And now, your anger starts to burn even hotter as you reflect on the cheater's lack of honor and respect for your best friend's marriage covenant. And that fire starts to burn deeply on the inside of you. What would y'all do? What would y'all do? What would y'all do? Tell it. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody else lying. <laughs> What would you do? You got valuable information that your best friend needs to know. Would you share it knowing that they needed it? Or would you remain silent if you knew it might end up with you being hurt? See, that's, that's the dilemma of this situation. It's that you feel this moral obligation to do what seems right. But what do you do? Yeah. Some people think, some people, not y'all, some, some people think, you should confront the cheater first. <laughs> I feel it. I'm in the story too, y'all. Some people think that you should tell your best friend about the infidelity. Some people think that you should run and tell past and let him handle it. 
I know that's happening. <laughs> but others, others might say, you should just keep your big, fat mouth shut. <laughs> men, tend, men tend to take that position. <laughs> Obviously, this cheater don't care. Ain't no telling how long this thing has been going on in the first place. Why should you say anything? If you tell your best friend and the marriage breaks up, though, you might be blamed for it or even worse. They might stay together, label you as a homewrecker, and disown you. And now you've lost your very best friend forever. And it seems like you'd have been better off if you just kept your big that mouth shut in the first place. But if you don't tell, if you don't tell, what happens? If you don't tell, your friend finds out that you knew the entire time, and then they might feel betrayed by you. It's the tension of the text. It's a dilemma. Something we all face. This is the same tension that the prophet Jeremiah struggled with in the text. My, my pastor, he once said, he said, all good preaching goes back to the text. So let's talk about Jeremiah in the text. He witnesses God's people participating in acts of infidelity. And he's compelled to confront these people. He's compelled to warn them about their wrongdoing. He's called to preach messages that challenge sin. He's called to preach messages that confront sin the people that 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 command repentance and pronounce eternal consequences for sin and he consistently does that throughout his ministry but but in verses 1 through 6 after preaching to the people about their infidelity to God they get offended they grab him they whoop his tail and then they shackle him in the stocks here he is a mighty man of God Preaching with power and authority. Got a nice sized church. Nice sized budget. 21 years his church has been sustained. And now he out there getting eye jammies and locked up in stocks. Hmm. Shackled and bound. Gaping wounds across his back. From the whipping he just received. Looking weak. Defeated, utterly powerless, preaching about a God powerful enough to destroy all his enemies while he himself has gone unprotected. And, and now he's the laughing stock of everybody he's been preaching to. Mm. The tension of the text. And then, and then we, we arrive at verses 7 through 9, our main text, where Jeremiah starts to complain to God about that whooping he just took simply for preaching what God told him to preach. Yeah. Verse number 7, he says, Lord, you persuaded me to preach. You blessed my life. You talked to me every day. You loved me. You wooed me. You won my heart. And that was so convincing that I believed you and I agreed to preach your word on your behalf to people who don't even want to hear it. Verse 8, but every time I preach, Lord, every time I prophesy, every time I warn your people about the consequences of sin, it backfires and blows up in my face. People hate to see me coming. Hate to see my YouTube channel blink live. They hate to hear my voice because they know what's coming. They're sick and tired of my condemning messages of judgment. And, and it seems like it always ends with me getting my tail beat and placed in handcuffs. And it seems like I would be better off not even saying anything to these people, but instead just keeping my big, fat mouth shut. Verse 9, but whenever I promise not to preach anymore, whenever I promise not to say your name, whenever I promise not to speak your prophetic warnings, whenever I promise not to call out misguided churches, whenever I promise not to confront false preachers, whenever I promise to start minding my own business and let them people ruin their own lives, I get all restless inside. Something happens to me. I just can't sit still. I, I can't eat. I, I can't sleep. I, I can't relax. 
relax and enjoy my life knowing that these people you love so dearly are on the fast track to hell for the rest of eternity. But I just can't keep my big fat mouth shut because it's like a fire on the inside of me, a fire that shut up in my bones. I got to say something. I'd rather you hate me than you go to hell. Care if you hate see me coming? You know what it is. I see you on the street, it's on sight. <laughs> you a sinner, your mama's a sinner, your grandmama was a sinner, it's on sight. Why? Because of the love we have for God's people, we just can't keep his truth to ourselves. You might hate my methods, but you'll love my outcomes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I try to, I try to hold it in, Chris. It's some, sometimes, some Sundays, we, we, we go to teach, and I'm like, man, I've been, it's been a couple years, man, and I've been, I've been throwing people in hell and preaching them out of it and ushering them into hell, and I think this week I might want to give them a little bit of cotton candy. I might want to give them a sweeter message. I might want to give them something that's going to increase my YouTube live numbers because they seem to like messages that make them feel all good about themselves. I try to hold it in, but, but it's just like fire. I try not to offend your, your autonomy. I want to let you live a little bit, but it's just like fire. I try not to offend people's personal preferences, but it's just like fire. I try not to meddle in marital affairs, but it's, it's just like fire. I try not to address the rebellion of bad kids, but I, I, I need to say something because it's just like a fire. I try not to call out sin and their need to repent, but it's just like a fire. Man, I'm tired of acting like people don't. Believe God's word applies to them. I'm tired of people acting like God's definition of sin don't apply to their lives. Like the Old Testament laws don't apply to New Testament believers. Like idolatry, okay. Like, like fornication is okay. Like sexual perversion is okay. And because I love them and because you love them, God, I just can't keep quiet. I can't watch them go to hell. I can't watch them destroy their lives because your word constantly burns on the inside of me. And it's like a fire, a fire that I can't quench, a fire I can't put out, a fire that won't let me rest, a fire that is shut up inside of my bones. Can't keep my big, my big fat mouth shut. I try. As soon as he asked me to come here and preach, I quickly said yes, because that's my brother. I love him. Man, what an honor to be invited. But then right after that, I was like, what did I get myself into? And you know when you go to a visiting church, you got to be on your best behavior, right? But just in case, just in case you didn't know, the prophet Jeremiah wasn't the only one that suffered just for preaching the God, the God filled message of the gospel. Yeah. There was a man named Jesus Christ, in case you didn't know, who left his heavenly throne to preach a message of repentance and salvation because he believed that we were all worth saving. And to help us start a relationship with him, he, he preached the salvation of grace by faith. He preached a message of love. He, he preached forgiveness from God. He preached, he preached salvation. He preached compassion. He preached redemption. And because he had fire shut up in his bones and, and, and because he wanted to help us endure this arduous middle process of living life as a Christian, he preached against sin. He, he preached against idolatry. He preached against fornication. He preached against injustice. He preached against oppression. He preached against unforgiveness. And because he had fire shut up down deep inside his bones, he preached against disobedience. These are lost messages now. He preached against materialism. Well, he preached against pridefulness, yeah. self-righteousness, yeah. just so that we could reach this expected end of dwelling in eternity forever. He even preached to us in the book of Revelation. He promised us the tree of life. He promised us authority over the nations. He promised us a brand new name. He promised us the crown of life. He promised us victory over Satan. And he promised that our names would never be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. 
And every year, every year we celebrate, every year we celebrate the anniversary of Jesus Christ. Y'all know he's got an anniversary too, and it's way longer than 21 years. Every time we celebrate the anniversary of Jesus Christ, we are celebrating because of his preaching. He was falsely convicted. He was beaten on a whipping post. He carried his cross to Calvary's hill. He was nailed to an old rugged cross. He was pierced in his side and died. He was placed in a buried tomb. He got up three days later all power in his hand to save our souls from eternal damnation. Why? All because he made a promise to us that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion till the day of Christ Jesus. Even that promise has a start, a middle, and an expected end. All because of he who began, that's the start. He began something good in each and every one of us, even when we can't see good in ourselves. There's something good that he's done, that he started on the inside of you. The arduous middle process. He began that good work and will carry it on for as long as it takes for your flesh and bones to die out. God is going to work on the inside of you. You know your problems. He knows your problems. I don't. He's going to work with you to get you where you need to be so that you will become who he wants you to be. It's the arduous middle process. Also that we can reach our expected end. We've been saying for hundreds of years, thousands of years, that Jesus is coming back. And in light of the world events, the latest world events, it could be today, right after you eat your lunch, it's the expected end. We do this thing. He preaches to y'all. She prays for y'all because they consider your expected end. So no matter what you're going through in life today, no matter what phase of this process you're in, whether you're at the start, whether you're in the middle, scrapping and fighting, whether you're waiting on God to fulfill promises that he promised, but you ain't seen them yet and you don't know if you're going to see them anytime soon, we just stay faithful to the expected end. If he promised it, he will deliver. Our job is to hold on until we receive it. It's the expected end. And some of those things we just might go to our graves believing for. But he promises that in the end, it will all be worth it. You will be rewarded in ways that you can't even fathom. Bow your heads. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time of instruction. Father, we celebrate this 21 years, and we know that it could not be done apart from your power and apart from your presence. It is only by your might, your mercy, and your grace that Antioch has been sustained for 21 years. Now we pray that your power and your glory and your will fall down in this place today. Touch the peoples. Speak to their ears. Touch their hearts. Compel them to, to, to respond to the call, Lord. You know that there are people in here who will be called to your ministry, who will receive the charge to take this ministry to another 21 years. Father, bless your leaders. Anoint them afresh. Empower them anew. Give them a new passion, a new vigor to evangelize and save the lost. Let your word consistently continue to go forward with might, passion, and power that your people might reach their expected end. Father, if it be thy will, bless us in the process. It is in your name that we will always give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.